Well, good morning. It's good to be with all of you. I had no idea um, that some of my deepest secrets around hot sauce would be exposed (laughs) from the get-go. I don't know who gave all that information. It couldn't have been my wife. You know, I was telling Ginger, um, I feel like, you know, those old school fundamentalist Baptist preachers who are the, the husband and wife team, the wife is the piano player, the husband's in the pulpit. And I said, we're, we're, we're doing it, babe, we made it. We're <laughs> She's on the keys and I'm in the pulpit, so this is fun. It's so good to be with you. I know Every Woman's Grace is such an incredible uh, blessing. Lauren does such an incredible job in this ministry. I'm so grateful for it. Uh, it's made a huge impact in my wife's life and I know in the life of this church. So it's really remarkable to be in, be in a church that's so well-established and grounded in ministry and to have the opportunity to have such a flourishing community of, of women who are pursuing the Lord so passionately and intentionally. Um, it makes a huge difference at Grace Church. And so for me, this is an honor to be able to speak to you this morning. And um, I, it's just in God's providence. I, I recently preached Hebrews to some of the college students And I had a high school winter camp a week or two ago, and Hebrews 6 was one of the texts there, so it works out well to bring it to you this morning. I'm excited for this text. It's, I do need to say, it's it's a sobering text. Hebrews 6 is one of the most um, intense warning passages, not even just in the New Testament, but in all of Scripture. It's heavy, and so this sermon will, will be a heavy sermon. It, it will be a sobering sermon, I hope. But, but not discouraging. The, the, the weight of this passage and the severity of this warning is not meant to discourage because the preacher to the book of Hebrew, to the, to the people in, um, of Hebrews, the Hebrew people, was, was not intending to discourage and, and to bring the people down. He was writing this, and originally, I know uh, Pete Simmons, sorry, <clears throat> Dr. Simmons, uh, <laughs> let you know that this was originally a sermon, so this would have been preached to a people who were struggling in their faith, and it's meant to establish them in the faith. So why don't we do this? Um, why don't we read the text, because we'll be looking at the entire chapter, and then we'll, ju- we'll jump into it and see what the Lord is saying to us um, through it this morning. I actually want to begin in chapter 5, verse 11. Oh, and here's a little disclaimer. So I was looking at everyone who's been teaching here. If I say anything that isn't in agreement with what you've heard so far, discount what I say, okay? <laughs> so uh, I concede to Riccardi and to Sammons on this and everyone else who's taught. So um, let's, let's read the text, beginning in chapter 5, verse 11, and we'll go through the end of chapter 6. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance." since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. 
Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, this is the very word of the living God and is relevant to every single one of us in this room this morning. Some years ago, I moved to San Antonio, Texas and joined a church soon after arriving. And I met a young man who was very passionate for evangelism and missions. He was younger than me by maybe three or four years and I was immediately struck by his zeal and his desire to bring the gospel to the streets of San Antonio. I would follow him out on Friday nights and we would evangelize to people uh, right outside the Alamo. And it was a really formative time for me because I was at a place in my life where I had been in the world for quite some time and had grown somewhat dull of hearing myself. And when I came to this little church, I was rejuvenated to pursue Christ in large measure, because some of these young men that I met who were younger than me, some of them hadn't grown up in the church, and yet they seemed to know more about Scripture than I did. And Adrian was one of those uh, men. He became a good friend, and we spent a lot of time together evangelizing, going through the streets of San Antonio. But maybe a year into my time at that church, Adrian stopped coming around as much, and we began to see sort of on his social media and different places that he was running back to his former manner of life. He was hanging with the same friends and doing the same things that he did before coming to Christ. I began to reach out to Adrian and he responded slower and slower and eventually it would go weeks without hearing a response. And in one last attempt to get Adrian to return to church, I um, called him, sort of pleaded with him to meet up with me for pizza, and we did. He, he came out and uh, to a little pizza shop, and I'll never forget the moment where I was sitting across the picnic table from him, a piece of, or a, a cheese pizza in between us, and I was urging him to, to come back. And with tears welling in his eyes, he looked at me and said, I never thought that this would be me. What he meant in that moment of sanity was, I never thought I would be one to abandon the faith. We'd seen others abandon the faith, but he never thought it could be him. I I didn't see Adrian much after that. He left the church, and I don't know where his soul stood, but I do know that several years later, he got sick, entered the hospital, and suddenly passed away. And for me, that reality of Adrian's apparent apostasy. I I pray that he dealt with Christ and had dealings with the Lord before his pastor, but I don't know. And as far as I knew, he was leaving what he had known, what he had discovered in Christ to go back to his former way of life. And even with this objective realization, I never thought it could be me or it would be me, he left anyway. That is the reality that we come to in Hebrews chapter six, a warning against apostasy. 
a warning to those who have come to taste the goodness of Christ and have entered the church, this world of supernatural love, and then abandon it for their former life. And as we look through this text, we are going to be warned ourselves of the terrifying reality that some will depart from the faith and leave Christ in their wake. But as I said at the start, this isn't meant to discourage us or to beat us up or to um, leave us hopeless. Rather, the preacher in this text is giving us this warning in order to bolster our faith, to bolster our resolve, to hold on to Christ, to stay by his side, to not let go. And I want us to discover the comfort of Christ in the midst of this terrifying warning of apostasy. Before I give you sort of the outline and the lay of the land of this passage, uh, we'll catch us up on a little bit of context. Um, I don't know if every speaker every week does this, but um, we do know, just, you know, repetition helps us to remember, we don't know exactly who the author is. Um, We don't know um, if it was Paul or or whomever. People people speculate, but ultimately, I don't think we can actually truly fully know But we do know the content of this book, and it's a book of better, isn't it? Jesus is better. I told the high school kids last week, if this was the title of like a pop album, it would be Jesus over everything. I like that. It's not copyrighted, so go ahead and use it. it. It really is that simple though, isn't it? Jesus is better. He's the better messenger, he's the better message, the better priest, the better sacrifice. And this message um, of Jesus is better was needed. Well, why was it needed? Because the original audience was thinking of leaving. You know, in those early days, it was exciting to be a follower of Jesus. Who, who couldn't get caught up in the excitement of this messianic figure who had been long anticipated preached of, and then came on the scene and did things no one had ever done. Free lunch, the, the best wine you've ever had. I don't know, raising the dead, healing lepers. Jesus, his fame spread and it spread quickly because no one could do what he did and no one could speak the way he did. He spoke with authority and passion and people were mesmerized and followed. But but then, of course, he was killed, but he didn't stay dead. Hundreds witnessed the resurrected Christ. And and so you can imagine these early Jewish uh, uh, followers hearing of Christ and and getting caught up in the excitement, and they they hear Peter preach at Pentecost, and, and they give their life to Christ. They put their faith in this Messiah, and they're baptized and they're added to the church and there's sort of a buzz and an excitement. Some of you have felt that, haven't you? When you first heard of Christ, you remember those moments and when you first came to a a, a gospel preaching church and you met people who didn't judge you the way the world judges you based on your economic status or social standing or physical appearance, you all of a sudden entered this radical world of love where people selflessly served you, not on the basis of you, but on the basis of they had been selflessly served by Christ. And so now they had love to freely give. And you remember those um, first weeks and months, and there's this buzz and excitement about the Christian life. Well, so it was for them. But after a while, that buzz started to wear off. And life got hard. And the reality of them having to leave Judaism and all of its surrounding attractions like the temple worship and the feasts and family was starting to set in. Their whole life had been built around the synagogue and now they were kicked out of it. And they started to face persecution. And as time passed, they began to feel, I think I might be missing out on something. Maybe this wasn't the life I really wanted to choose in following this Jesus. Not only that, they were facing persecution in Rome. Their homes at points were being plundered. They weren't quite being slaughtered yet, but they were being beaten and some of them were being imprisoned for their Christianity. And the years were passing 
and they were beginning to feel like maybe they made the wrong choice. So as you read Hebrews, and you'll spend the next weeks in Hebrews, um, it, it might be helpful for you to try to, whenever you enter this passage, get your mind into the setting of a Sunday morning 2,000 years ago and, and sit in the seat that these hearers would have sat in um, when this preacher came to deliver this sermon. Life isn't going well. Persecution is hard. And Jesus isn't back yet. What's going on? What can Jesus really do for me? Did I make the right decision? Because so far, I'm losing interest. And so the the preacher addresses issues like doubt, denying, apostasy. And you know, I I, want to be sympathetic to the hearers in the book of Hebrews because the preacher is. We get that tone. I really think it's a good question for us to ask when a preacher stands and opens the word of God, I think it's a good question for you to ask, what do you have for me? Do, Do you actually have anything for me? Do you have a message that is actually going to do something for me? If you say this is the word of God and God is my creator and my maker and the purpose for my existence, what do you have for me? Oh, and the preacher has an answer. I've got Jesus. I mean, Hebrews is one long exposition of the person of Jesus Christ. And just a personal note on the tone and the message. This was really important for me to emphasize to the high school students last week, but I think it's important for me to emphasize to all of us that the the preacher doesn't speak down to or disregard these struggling saints. I think it's easy for a preacher to do that, to stand up here and go, what are you, doubting? What, do you think the world's better? We do that to our kids a lot, right? Why are you so tempted with what your high school buddies are doing? Stop it. Just follow Jesus. Just come to church. Just stop disobeying. And we act like it's just no big deal. Like, you're so stupid for being tempted with that. That, But but that's not, I mean, that's not the approach of the preacher. If you notice, um, I mean, it's a brilliant sermon. He, He doesn't just say, well, stop, stop being tempted back to the old priesthood. What are you, crazy? Stop being tempted back to the old sacrifices. What's wrong with you? He actually talks about the grandeur of those things and says, yeah, I get it. Temple life was really appealing. No, I get it. Moses was amazing. What a leader. I I get it. The, The message delivered by angels. Angels brought a message from heaven. I can see why, I can see why you're being tempted to leave. But can I just tell you something? And can I show you something? Let me systematically show you why Jesus is greater than anything that could tempt you away. And friends, it's that way in our life as well. I know it. It it, it gets long, life is hard, and persecution comes. And the preacher doesn't just discount that, but he very carefully and, and kindly says, can I just show you why Jesus is worth it? And at the end of it, when he does there's a resounding cry in the heart of the believer saying, what was I thinking? Jesus is better. I'm gonna hang on no matter what it costs me. It's better to be with Jesus. Okay, now we come to chapter six. And this is really, this is really fascinating knowing that this is a sermon because chapter five Beginning kind of the end of chapter four, we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens. He's now addressing the issue theologically of the priesthood of Jesus. Because you have to remember that the Jews had thousands of years of a priesthood. That was how their sin was dealt with. And all of a sudden Jesus comes along and says, no more offerings, no more sacrifices. I'm it, to tell us die. It is finished. And that would have been culturally jarring for them. Imagine you grew up in church every week. You go to church three times a week. You're there doing Adventure Club or Awana back in the day. For most of us, it would have been Awana. And then all of a sudden, a preacher comes and says, that's done. You don't have to go to church anymore. You don't do any of that. It's done. You would be very, just, I'm not thinking on a theological level. I'm just thinking culturally, that would be jarring, right? 
to change everything you've known. That's how it was for them. All of that sacrificial system priesthood gone. And he's making the point that Jesus is the great high priest. He's the one who sat down. He completed the job. No more. And notice what he says at the, in chapter 5, verse 10. He introduces this name that's really difficult to spell, Melchizedek. And he says, he was designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we go, who's Melchizedek? And preaching, he's sitting there thinking, okay, I'm going to tell you about Melchizedek. But then he notices, you know what? I don't know if they're ready for Melchizedek. So he says, about this, we have much, we have much to tell you. And it's hard to explain because you've become dull of hearing. And so he starts out this passage warning them of immaturity, of dullness. So he's, he's gonna go into Melchizedek and this Melchizedekian priesthood, but he has to pause and address their immaturity to, before he can even get there. And he says, some of them are immature. You, 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 you're like babies who need milk. I was gonna, I'm about to give you this filet mignon of Melchizedek. And, and I need to get out the bottle and like warm it up and say, okay, here you go, sweetheart. And, and he's saying, That's, that, that shouldn't be. You, you should be moving on to the, the higher, the deeper realities. I, I wanna get into these beautiful realities of who Christ is and what he's done, but I've got to pause because some of you have grown dull of hearing. So, some of you, this has just become white noise to help you go to sleep. And it hasn't, it's not impacting you like it once did. You need to lay hold of the basic realities of Christ once again. And so in a very kind and a very pastoral way, chapter six begins with him urging them, leave the elementary principles. Let's move on to the, the, the depths of who Christ is. But then in, in verse four, and this is where we'll kind of dig in our teeth, he He's warning them of immaturity, but, but then he actually, it's like, he's, it's like his, his, his wheels are turning and he's wondering, maybe the issue is deeper than immaturity. Maybe for some of you, you're, you're spiritually dead and you've never been awakened at all. And so that's where he begins with this terrifying warning. And here's how I've broken up the passage. We're gonna look at a terrifying apostasy, verses four through eight of chapter six. Verses nine through 12 will be a comforting assurance. And then verses 13 to 20 will be a certain promise. And Lauren said I have to 1145 to preach, so we're good on time. <laughs> okay, so um, let's, let's consider a terrifying apostasy. And first, he speaks about this impossibility. It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying, once again, the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. He, he speaks about this impossibility. It's impossible for these who have fallen away to come back to repentance. Who are the these? Who are they? Well, they are those who have once, notice what he says, been enlightened. That's that initial illumination. They heard the gospel and it impressed them. A light bulb went off. It made sense, as it should. God is the God of truth. God is truth. His word is truth. And in an anti-truth world, when truth is heard, it can click. And people are enlightened by it and they've, They've heard this gospel message and they've had an enlightening moment. And in fact, they've tasted the heavenly gift. Now, this heavenly gift is certainly speaking of salvation, but notice he says they've tasted this gift. They've had a little nibble on this gift. So somehow they've experienced the reality of this salvation, but they haven't quite eaten it. They haven't digested it. They haven't taken it down. This metaphor of tasting is trying to give us the, the idea that they've, ex, they've experienced it somewhat. 
this heavenly gift. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? They, they have been partakers where the Holy Spirit has been at work. They've tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. This sounds like a Christian, doesn't it? But we have to remember the reality of a Judas who was amongst those sent out by Jesus to cast out devils and to herald the good news of his coming. And he did. Judas was amongst them. Even the demons were subject to the disciples of Christ when they spoke in his name, and Judas was amongst them. What we have to remember is that what is happening here is what happens to anyone who comes amongst a biblical church and sees the the Spirit working to regenerate and transform the lives of the people. They've tasted the goodness of the word of God. You know, God's word, because it's truth, produces good stuff. You see that. In someone who starts to conform their life to the word of God, good things will will be born from that. It it just order and and, um, there's there's a certain sanctification that can happen to someone who begins to seek, even if it's there in their own effort, to conform their life to the principles of God's word. And so they're coming amongst a people transformed by it, and they themselves are starting to see, wow, there, there's, some, there's some goodness, and there's, there's power in this place. But then, verse 6 tells us they've fallen away. Now, that should be terrifying, Because this description sounds like a Christian. But he says it's impossible to restore them again to repentance. Now let's just pause there for a moment. He's not speaking of losing salvation. We know that because in verse nine, or in verse, yeah, in verse nine, he says, though we speak in this way about them, in your case, beloved, I'm confident of better things, things that pertain to salvation. So whatever that was, it's not salvation because he's confident that these, the beloved, are saved. So, He's not saying, wow, they they tasted eternal life, but it turned out to be temporary life and they lost it. No, no, no. Whatever this is, it can't be genuine conversion because we know even from the explicit teachings of Christ that it's impossible to lose your salvation. So what is it? Friends, this is speaking of those who have come amongst the people of God, have experienced the goodness of the word of God and the reality of the Holy Spirit and the, the beauty of Christ, but then knowingly and willingly turn around and walk away from it. And what he's saying is, in that case, it's impossible. If you reject that reality and that truth, what hope is there for you? There is no salvation for you. Think of Judas again. He knew Jesus. He experienced it all, and yet he walked away. Friends, so many of you have experienced what's being described in verses four and five here at Grace Church. The goodness of the age to come. And so this should scare us. Look look at what he does in verse uh, seven. He uses an illustration. The Bible loves illustrations to sort of emphasize this point. And it's important to to understand this illustration because verse seven, the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless, near to being cursed, its end is to be burned. What's the illustration? Well, it's it's a common illustration we have in scripture of fruit. You could think immediately of the parable of the sower, right? Seed, the same seed of the gospel is laid down. 
and the different soils respond differently to the seed. Some seed, it sprouts up quickly. Those who receive the gospel with joy, but then the sun comes out and beats down upon them. It's the sun of persecution and difficulty, and it, it just withers and goes away. Or the seed that's born amongst the thorns, and it too comes up quite quickly, but then the thorns begin to choke it out, and Jesus says those are the cares of the world, the delights and pleasures of the former life. And, and so Jesus is quickly abandoned in that scenario as well. And it's the same illustration here. Seed is laid, but, but there's no fruit. Nothing comes of it. Okay, we've got to move on to the next section, but I, I, I do think it's good to ask this question. In a room full of this many people, is this you? And how would you know if it is? Because this person described does look like a Christian and even Judas wasn't suspected by his fellow disciples, was he? Remember the the Last Supper where Jesus says, one of you here will betray me? What did the disciples say? Is it me? They didn't go, oh, Judas, where's Judas at? (laughs) Judas, Jesus is, he just mentioned you. (laughs) Judas is getting falafel like what? No, 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 they, they, and here's the interesting thing. Even Ju- Judas said, is it me? But he knew. Because if you read in the text, just before he had already accepted the silver. It was a feigned, is it, is it me? But the disciples genuinely are concerned. And so that's a good concern. You in this room, all of us should ask, is this me? Well, as unsettling as that is, we move on to a comforting assurance in verses 9 through 12. Because the preacher in verse 9 is confident, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, by the way, never is that phrase beloved used for unbelievers. He's addressing those he's confident, know, and love Christ. And he says, we are certain of better things, things that pertain or belong to salvation. So whatever that was, it wasn't salvation. So what's the difference? Well, let's let's look at verse 10. For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. All of that stuff in verses four and five is an important component of Christianity. The enlightenment, the understanding of the gospel and the experience of the work of the spirit in the body of the church. But there's something more to genuine conversion. And notice what he says, your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. I want us to look at another text here because it's gonna really flesh this out for us right here in Hebrews. But uh, yeah, you know what? Go to, go to chapter 10. Because that, that first statement about um, impossible in the case of those who've once been enlightened, that enlightenment, what did it produce in their lives according to the illustration? Thorns and thistles, right? So there was a mental enlightenment, an aha light bulb, but it didn't do anything in their life. But these, those he's confident of, look at what he says in chapter 10, verse 32. Recall the former days, the good old days when you were first on fire for the Lord, right? After you were what? Enlightened. Then what's the next phrase? You endured. Something happened. It produced something. That enlightenment didn't just stay in the mind. It produced something in your life. You endured a hard struggle with sufferings. And then look at what he says. He describes the sufferings. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those treated. Now notice this. Verse 34, you had compassion on those in prison. And this is wild you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. 
you joyfully embraced being beaten, ridiculed, imprisoned, and robbed. Why? Because this earth is not my home. I have a better possession. Oh, you're, you're treating me the way you treated my Messiah? I'll count it all joy. When I suffer, when I encounter sufferings of various kinds, because I'm suffering with Christ. And he reminds them of that. I told you that this, this preacher is a loving, compassionate preacher. He's not scolding them. He's reminding them, I, I know you're not of those who fall away. Are you scared you could fall away? I know it's terrifying, but remember when you were first saved? Remember what it produced? Remember how you endured? And notice this. Uh, it doesn't, it wasn't just self-centric. This is gonna teach us something about holiness. They endured sufferings, right? But then they loved others who were also suffering. We, uh, Ginger and I named our, our first daughter Felicity after the early Christian martyrs in Carthage in 203 AD, Perpetua and Felicitas were slaughtered in the Colosseum for their faith. And you can read the passion of Perpetua, it's gripping. And as they were being slaughtered in the Colosseum, Perpetua was gored by a bull, not killed, separated from Felicity, got up, and in her suffering, stripped naked before the jeering crowd, looked for and found Felicity, helped her up, and then together they died arm in arm. But in that moment, she's thinking about her, her, her friend, And notice what's happening here. They're suffering and they don't become insulated and isolated and self-centered. In their own suffering, they're looking to have compassion on others who are suffering. And he's reminding them of this reality in their life. In the midst of it all, they cared for others. Friends, that's supernatural selflessness, isn't it? And that is the sort of selflessness that's produced by regeneration. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, that, he saved us so that, we who, uh, so that we who have died, he died for us so that we for whom he has died would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who for our sake was crucified. We no longer live for ourselves. That's a lesson about holiness, by the way, that true holiness is selfless. It's, it's got to be more than what the opening verses described, just about mental assent and understanding. Th- those in Hebrews chapter six, verses four and five, certainly read the theology books. They probably, now, mm, I know I'm on video here, but I'm just gonna go out on a limb. If they had EWG, they probably would have finished their homework before anybody. <laughs> and like every single question. Good heavens, I see your homework. And I'm like, What? How do you answer that? Um, that? It's intense. And they would have had it filled out because they knew. But what did it produce in their life? For these, there was a selflessness and a love of others. Friends, we so easily misconstrue and misunderstand holiness, don't we? It's so easy for us to think holiness is like reading our Bible or whatever. Friends, that's part of it. That's a foundation. But the scriptures are meant to go deep into your soul in order to produce something in your life. That's why James says, don't be one who hears the word but doesn't do it. Holiness is first upward, a love for God, and then it's outward, a love for others. And that should be encouraging because it's so simple. Have you ever thought, I'm running out of time, 11, do I have to finish at 11? Okay, I have 32 seconds, so, and 12 verses to go. So this is good. We're doing good here. Austin Duncan is my mentor, and so he's, just wanna shout that out. Um, the, the, the paradigm of righteous living in the Old Testament is a woman of Proverbs 31. You wanna know what it looks like to live a life with godly wisdom? It looks like the woman of Proverbs 31. Read that and tell me what righteousness looks like. It looks like Ruth, who, by the way, in the old ordering of the Hebrew scriptures, we've mixed it all up. In the ordering of the Hebrew scriptures, you know what comes immediately after Proverbs? The book of Ruth. The only time that phrase, a worthy woman or a virtuous woman, is used in the Hebrew scriptures is in Proverbs and Ruth. 
And look at the life of Ruth. She wasn't some grand theologian with four PhDs. She says nothing about her devotional time. But her love for Yahweh translated into a practical, simple love for others where she selflessly served. And some of you need to be reminded of that because you're beating yourselves up because you've got snotty kids at home who you think are just the biggest brats in the world. And you, you go, I didn't even read my Bible this week and I haven't done my homework for EWG. And Lauren's gonna like show up and say, uh, may I speak with you? And you're gonna call to the principal's office. And you're so, you're, 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 you're building your holiness. And yet, friends, look, A life pursuing Christ is loving those he's put in your care and in your world to love. And some of you are demonstrating the radical, supernatural, Holy Spirit-infused holiness of caring for your kids and loving your husband and then asking the person sitting next to you, how are you, and meaning it, and then serving them in their needs. It's so simple and practical and beautiful, and the preacher is reminding them, them of that. Be bolstered in your faith. Don't let go because I've seen it in you, is what he's saying. Verses 11 and 12 of chapter six, he just gives this pastoral commendation, like, keep going, come on. It's this, it's this press. He knows these people. He's looking into their eyeballs and saying, don't let go. Keep having that same earnestness of loving the Lord and loving one another. Okay, as we end here, Oh, can I just say this? So, sorry. Um, what, what's really beautiful, and we can lose sight of this, but zoom out for a second. This preacher clearly knows them, right? He knows them. Don't underestimate the value of having pastors and people in your life who know you so that in your darkest moments, when you're thinking of leaving it all, they can come along and go, stop it. Don't think like that. You are not, like he says in chapter 10, you're not those who let go. You are of the family that endures. Stop thinking that way. I know you love Christ. Hold on. He's encouraging people he knows and cares for. That's why Christianity has lived in community. Are you plugged into that community? Do you have someone who can preach this sermon to you? Do you have people in your life who can encourage or exhort you because you're gonna need that. That's what all of Hebrews is, is someone who knows and loves them, encouraging them not to let go. Okay, um, so we've seen this terrifying apostasy. We've seen this comfort and assurance. Verses 13 to 20, you can do a bit of self-study here. He gives, he, he ends in verse 12 saying, um, hold on, be patient, you're gonna get the promise the promise of glory. It's going to be yours. It's worth it. And he, no, he mentions promise and then immediately goes into what I'm calling these last seven verses, a certain promise. He shows them why they can bank their soul on the reality of the promise that Jesus will rescue them. And he gives the example of Abraham. Remember, Sarah laughed when, Ab- when God first gave him the promise, but then what? What happened? God delivered. He, he did what he said he would do for Abraham. And I'll just point this out. In verses 16 to 18, we see the essence of what it means to have faith. And in that phrase in verse 18, it is impossible for God to lie. He's encouraging them, bank your soul on the reality that God will do what he said he will do because God cannot lie. In the words of our pastor, John, MacArthur, he says, God invented truth. God is truth. He cannot lie. His saying is his doing. And faith is believing that, that what God said he will do, he will do. And so this last exhortation from the preacher is reminding them, friends, I know you can lose sight of it, but he's going to deliver you. And then you tie that into the broader theme of Hebrews, He's gonna deliver you, deliver you to a better land. He's not just taking you to Canaan. Remember the Israelites, they didn't even believe him. He'd take them to Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. He, he's taking you to the ultimate Canaan, new heavens and new earth. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. 
but I don't feel like I'm going to inherit the earth because everything's being taken from me and nobody even loves me and I have no community. He said you will inherit the earth. It is impossible for him to lie. It's yours. Hold on. Even if it requires patience, even if it requires patience, notice how often he says, be patient. Okay, last note as we end here. He, I, I am very, I kind of geek out on this as a preacher because what the preacher did, remember how he was gonna mention Melchizedek in verse 10 of chapter five? Notice how he ends. He says, we have as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Jesus, he's talking about Jesus, who's the ultimate seal that God will do what he promised. He promised for thousands of years, a Messiah's coming and then Jesus came. So if you ever doubt the Lord, look at the historical figure of Jesus Christ who walked this earth and now resides in glory, interceding for the saints. That is the stamp that God will do what he promised. Don't ever doubt it. And he points to Jesus and says, this is the anchor of our soul, the reality of Christ. But then like masterfully, he would ace preaching lab at TMS. (laughs) Notice what he does where Jesus has gone as a forerunner, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let's get back into the theology. You rejuvenated? You ready to hold on? You're not gonna let go, are you? Let's talk about Melchizedek. And I'll leave that for someone else next week. (laughs) But now he's, he's, he's back to the theological point he's making. Um, So uh, guys, a beautiful passage, a really fascinating passage. It's a unique one. We don't see it a lot in scripture because much of scripture are are letters written. This is a sermon preached. So you've kind of got that spontaneity of the preacher. Um, And and yet it's so encouraging for us to hold fast to our hope. And and as you leave here, I, I would just say this. Is the warning terrifying? It is, and it should be. But everyone who is, Abandon Christ has done so willfully. Stay close to Jesus. No one, no one has or ever will go to hell trusting in Jesus. So stay by his side. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to be rejuvenated, to be bolstered in our trust of who you are. Um, Lord, spur us on to continue fighting the good fight, that we might hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. I pray this in Christ's name, amen.